Hey guys, welcome to episode 12 of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple podcast by BSL Nutrition. I am Ben Brown, your host, co-founder and CEO of BSL Nutrition. Today I had the opportunity to be joined by Dr. Elisa Song. Elisa is a board certified Stanford, NYU, UCSF trained holistic pediatrician. She founded Whole Family Wellness, an integrative pediatric practice in Belmont, California, one of the first and most highly regarded holistic pediatric practices in the country. Elisa created HealthyKidsHappyKids.com, which is dedicated to empowering parents to take charge of their kids' health naturally. She's a holistic pediatrician, integrating conventional pediatrics with functional medicine, holistic nutrition, homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine, and essential oils, and also a lecturer for the Center for Education and Development in Clinical Homeopathy, Academy for Pain Research, Institute for Functional Medicine, and Holistic Pediatric Association, among others. You guys are going to be blown away by this interview. We go deep into kids' health, into supporting kids' immune system. What is the immune system? How can we protect it and support it from in utero all the way through kids' development? through food, through nutrition, through stress management and supplementation. We talk about preventing and and supporting fevers. We talk about uh, supporting the gut. And uh, so we really take a deep dive on this one. And I I don't think you're going to want to miss it. So uh, check it out. And uh, of course, any feedback would be most appreciated. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and uh, hey, guys, if you love this podcast, then uh, do me a favor and leave a review. Okay, appreciate you, and I'll see you on the other side. Elisa, how are you? I am doing great. How are you, Ben? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the BSL Nutrition Podcast today. Um, It's definitely been a long time coming. So tell me, because you are more of a conventionally trained medical doctor and yet mm-hmm. you've shifted into this more integrative, more holistic practice, yeah. how did that really come about? You know, it's, it's interesting because my background, you know, I grew up, my mother was an OBGYN, very conventional. I didn't have any, any exposure to alternative medicine. Um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. There wasn't a lot there. And it really was in um, college that I, my eyes were open, right? I, I came out to California and, you know, there was more you know, acupuncture and mindfulness kind of just starting. And so that opened my eyes. And so when I went to medical school, I had this idea in my head that, wow, I'd really like to incorporate some of those alternative modalities into my sort of um, worldview of how medicine is practiced and what I could offer to patients. And I really didn't see anything that I liked in conventional medical Mm -hmm. school. It just, it wasn't, um, nothing resonated with me. And the same thing happened in pediatrics residency. I just saw, um, you know, I trained at UCSF, which is an amazing, you know, tertiary quaternary care specialty hospital in San Francisco. And we see the sickest of the sick there. But what I saw was that kids were really just getting, um, getting Band-Aid medicine, really, right? You know, you, you put little Band-Aids on the symptoms and then they come back, you know, they do well for a little bit, come back after a few months, you know, have another crisis and get some more Band-Aids put on their symptoms. But we weren't really getting to the root cause of what was going on and, and it just never sat well with me. And so after residency, I really uh, pursued more um, integrative work and I found functional medicine. You know, I found functional medicine. I went to uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine training program back in 2004, I believe it was. And I think I actually was probably the first pediatrician to do the functional medicine training program. And I was totally hooked. I mean, this idea that, you know, food is medicine and it's not just, you know, the makeup of all the calories and the micro and the macronutrients Mm -hmm. that we're putting in, but you know, this, this global idea of what optimal health is and what optimizing our diet is not just meeting the minimum, you know, recommended daily allowances, but really looking at what is this child's particular makeup? What is, you know, his or her particular individualized needs for health and wellness and nutrition and what goes into being healthy, not just food, but even, you know, the thoughts we're thinking and the air we're breathing and, you know, how much we're slowing down our lives and being mindful, um, you know, all of that, you know, goes into being healthy. And, and I just was absolutely hooked. You know, I I could really, I started seeing kids with autism and with 
chronic asthma and severe eczema, more and more kids with autoimmune illness. And, you know, these kids that were really sick, not getting answers in conventional medicine, really just getting maybe steroids for their treatments or, you know, suppressing medicines. Um, and by starting with their gut, you know, healing their immune systems, healing their nervous systems. Um, I was able to get so many kids and still am, you know, so fortunate today to work with these families where I can really um, get to the root cause of their illnesses and, and heal them and get them thriving. So, I mean, that's really what keeps me going every day. <laughs> you know, what it's a, great. That's, that's such a unique journey. I, I imagine, I don't know, how, did, what was the response from your colleagues, maybe from your mother as you went through that? <laughs> of medicine journey because from a, a conventional medicine standpoint i imagine that you you experience some uh, pushback yeah you know it, that's that's a great question um you know when i was looking into medical school um i actually looked into a school called bastier right this is back in the um early 90s and you know back then I mean, hardly anyone knew what naturopathic medicine was. And, you know, my mother, my family, they, they just thought, what are you, what are you looking into? <laughs> you know, just go to medical school. Nobody right. knows what an ND is and you're going to be able to do so much more as an MD. Yeah. So I did, I went to medical school instead of naturopathic school. And, um, you know, I think even then that kind of desire for, for more natural medicine informed how I looked at my medical school training and residency training. Um, but, you know, they... I, I'm thankful that my family has been supportive. Right? My husband's been really supportive. Um, when I decide to leave conventional medicine and open up my own practice, you know, a purely integrative pediatric practice, um, he was fully supportive um, emotionally, you know, financially, um, you know, just on that really kind of um, uh, more family united front level, right? Because we were taking a risk yeah. and, uh, and I'm so glad we did. And, and actually in looking back, I am glad that I went the medical school route first uh, because at this point now as an integrated pediatrician, a board certified pediatrician, I do have as part of my toolkit, the option to use pharmaceuticals if needed, but sure. you know, really, you know, when we, when it comes down to it, there are very few times when we absolutely need to use that pharmaceutical and antibiotics can be life-saving and I of course I prescribe antibiotics but there's so many fewer times when I need to and now when I prescribe antibiotics I know exactly what to do to help support that baby and that child's gut microbiome and their gut health so that they are healthy for the rest of their lives so you know I can integrate these different tools like nutrition and homeopathy and essential oils and acupuncture and functional medicine um, and I think you know really give kids it's the best of, of all worlds. And I certainly don't practice all modalities. There's, you know, there's so many amazing modalities out there like Reiki and Ayurvedic medicine and all these traditions that offer so much. And, you know, I have a, a more expanded toolkit um, than many physicians, but there's so many out there. And that's why I really build a, a, a network, right? A, a collaboration. Um, it's really teamwork. And as a mama or a papa, if you're listening and your child has health needs or special needs, um, you want to, um, you want to build that teamwork of, of professionals who can work together and collaborate, right? It's never just one thing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's that journey together that really will, will get your child well. Yeah, I love that. I think that's, that's very relevant is supporting them with a the team, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. you on the medical side, having a chiropractor. Having, oh, absolutely. Uh, someone absolutely. to support them in their nutritional needs. And because there's no reason you should have to do everything and nor, nor should you be able to. Yeah. So, well, and you know, nobody knows everything, right? right? Nobody has all the answers. And so, you know, if you ever have a practitioner who thinks that they can do everything, it's time to, you know, look a little broader. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. So cool. So you have your private practice, your seen now you you have a, a full family practice now but you your specialization is pediatrics yes yes and so i imagine as you mentioned we're seeing a lot of issues with uh, attention issues gut issues um, autoimmune disease yeah i want yeah. i want people to understand the relevance of the immune system in mm -hmm preventing illness in supporting cognitive function and gut health and how they all tie together. So would you be willing to kind of take us from the ground up in terms of how that immune system, you know, develops from birth on and, and then what the things along the way that are really, really important for us to do to kind of support that immune system? Yes, absolutely. I'd be happy to. And, you know, 
in functional medicine, we say that all health starts in the gut, and this absolutely is true. I think especially for children, you know, when we have this golden opportunity in utero, you know, and when they're born to really shape what their gut microbiome looks like. And, you know, if you just um, open up the paper, I mean, pretty much every, almost every day, every week, there's an, another research paper on the impact of the gut microbiome on our mental health, on our immune health, on our, um, you know, of course, our gut health, on our hormonal health. Um, and, you know, we call the gut the second brain for a reason. You know, many people don't realize this, but probably up to 80 to 90% of all the serotonin and all the dopamine in our body is made by our gut lining. And serotonin, if you, as many of you may be aware, that's our feel-good hormone, right? It's our feel-good neurotransmitter. It helps us be resilient. It helps us manage stress. It helps us to be happy and calm. It helps us to fall asleep easily. Mm -hmm. And dopamine is our reward hormone. It keeps us motivated. It keeps us, you know, really attending and focusing well. Um, and so for our kids nowadays, there is an epidemic of anxiety and depression that I see very early on, even, you know, in, in, elementary school, you know, we're, we're seeing issues with anxiety, depression, attention problems, you know, whether or not it's full-blown ADD or ADHD, many of our kids, if you, I mean, I've, I've, this is our last day of school, my son is graduating kindergarten and my daughter is graduating first grade. And the number of kids when I volunteer that I see who don't, they're not diagnosed with ADHD, but they're not able to really sustain that focused attention um, to, listen to a story for, for five minutes. You know, I'm not right. expecting a five-year-old to sit there for an hour <laughs> and pay attention. Um, but to be able to really, you know, um, pay attention, not wiggle constantly, not touch their friend constantly, you know, just to be calm and, and centered in their body for, for brief moments of time, that is, it, we're losing that. And that has, to, I think, all to do with the gut. Um, the gut is also the heart of our immune system. You know, we have these tonsils in our throat, right? That's, you know, our mouth is the beginning of our digestive tract. And we go all the way from kind of mouth to anus. Mm -hmm. And what many people don't realize is these tonsil-like patches line our entire GI tract. And our gut really contains this gut-associated lymphoid tissue, this GALT, um, is really the largest part of our immune system. And our gut, you know, the food we eat, the microbes we ingest with our food, that's one of our first contacts that our body has with the outside world, right? We think of our gut as the inside, but we're really this long, big tube. And what's on, on the inside, you know, our gut right. is our exposure to the world, right? right. And the way that those microbes interact with all of that gut associated lymphoid tissue and that mucus associated lymphoid tissue, um, that informs how our gut communicates with our immune system cells and then trains our immune system. And this is where we see with a lot of kids with autoimmune illness and eczema and asthma are now considered autoimmune illnesses. Um, so this is where things can go wrong, where the gut composition can go awry. You know, we can get yes. something called gut dysbiosis, where right. we have some abnormal makeup of bacteria, yeast, parasites. Um, and then that trains our immune system improperly. Um, you know, we're also, you know, this training of the immune system and our gut starts even before babies are born. You know, it starts in utero. And, you know, I would say for any mom out there, any dad out there um, who, if, who's thinking about getting pregnant, you have this opportunity before you get pregnant to optimize your gut health, you know, get that gut really as clean as you can, address any gut dysbiosis, yeast overgrowth, food sensitivities. And we'll talk about something called leaky gut, which many of you are probably familiar with, at least the term. Um, but when mom's gut is healthy, she is going to transmit actually through her placenta, all of those good probiotics um, that will then train that baby's developing gut and immune system in utero um, and, and really have that baby have the best chance at starting life on, on a great footing. You know, the other factors uh, in utero and, you know, around the birth that can impact the gut the, of the baby um, is um, maternal stress. It's incredible. They found that maternal stress while you're pregnant can actually change the composition of the vaginal microbiome. Um, and we've also found that moms, when they take antibiotics or things like Zantac, I mean, a lot of moms have reflux when they're pregnant, right? Yeah. So when they take Zantac or antibiotics and ch it changes her gut flora, which then can alter the baby's gut flora and increase the risk of that baby developing eczema and asthma later on.
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, if you need to take antibiotics for a urinary tract infection while you're pregnant, absolutely. I'm not going to say don't take the antibiotics, but we can do things like having fermented foods and taking probiotics and things like glutamine to restore your gut health so that your baby's gut microbiome will be well established when, when the baby comes out. Um, the way we're born, C-section or vaginal birth has a huge impact too on that baby's gut microbiome. You know, what many people don't realize is um, when babies are born, their gut lining is essentially quote sterile there's not really any bacteria in there and they rely on exposure to that mama's birth canal um, you know the vaginal microflora um, the probiotics that they get from nursing um, and from kissing <laughs> right all of mm-hmm. that um, to to colonize that baby's gut and we find that babies who are born by C-section, within about two weeks of age their gut bacteria looks much more like skin bacteria the normal healthy gut bacteria. Um, And that can set the stage again Mm -hmm. for sort of um, ongoing gut dysregulation and imbalances that then might put that baby more at risk for eczema and asthma and autoimmunity and, you know, all sorts of downstream complications. Um, So I mentioned the breastfeeding, right? Breastfeeding has so many different factors in it, not just, um, you know, the immune factors that many of us are aware of that support that baby's immune system. um, But, you know, these, these um, really these prebiotic factors that help all those good bacteria grow in our baby's gut. Um, We also get probiotics from breast milk. And so breastfeeding can also have a huge impact on supporting that baby's gut microbiome. And, you know, I I totally get it. Some moms aren't able to produce enough milk for whatever reason, um, may need to supplement with formula fully or um, or partially, and you know, you should never feel guilty about the decisions that you've made. Um, it's it's really what works best for the family and what what works best for that um, mother baby dyad. Uh, but I will say, if if you are having trouble nursing, you know, every little bit does count, right? You know, even if you're just able to give one yes. one feed a day of breast milk, it will help. Um, and then if you're not able to nurse, then we support that baby's gut. You know, there's it, nothing is irreversible. There's always hope. Even if your baby is sick or your child is sick, we can reverse the gut dysregulation, you know, whatever damage might have been done. Um, But knowledge is power, right? We need to know that, first of all, there is this gut dysregulation and that we can do something about it. Um, And, you know, for instance, with moms, we found that for babies, when there's a family history of eczema and asthma, and of course we know that that baby might be more at risk for developing eczema and asthma and allergies, if that mom takes a probiotic during the third trimester and while she's nursing, that baby has a significantly lower risk of developing eczema and asthma. Um, so really, you know, there are many, many steps that we could take to support that mama's gut microbiome during pregnancy. And then after the baby is born to support that baby's gut microbiome to really establish a healthy gut balance. Um, and we do have that golden opportunity before babies are two. Um, What's surprising for many is that the gut microbiome after two years of age is almost identical to an adult microbiome. It's very difficult to change that gut balance after year two, um, which is why we see that babies who have had antibiotics or antacid medications um, in infancy are much more likely later on to have things like eczema and asthma and autoimmune illnesses. Hmm. Um, And that's also the same reason that once kids in my practice and my own children, after they turn two, the whole family can take the same probiotic. They don't need to take a kid's probiotic. They can take the same one as, as you know, you're taking as a parent. Um, and that just makes it easier for the whole household. Um, but you know, if I can get kids before two, really, you know, get them on the right track with a healthy gut, then that is going to keep them so much healthier. Um, you know, you'll have to, you'll see the doctor way less, (laughs) you know, makes my life much easier and makes, you know, that kid thrive so much more. No, it's incredible. It sheds so much light to just the big picture and how you talk about the gut is the mm-hmm. second brain. It's the heart of the immune system. Yep. And so really doing everything we can to support not only our own, but our children's uh, immune system through gut health. And not right. only, it's not only just the, the, the foods that you're feeding them, but the, the lifestyle, managing stress, all of those things. So let's get a little bit more tangible um, now that we understand the relevance of the immune system in the gut, 
how do we or what products can we implement with our child? So let's just assume because the prevalence of autoimmune, because the prevalence of, uh, the prevalence of ADHD and, and cognitive um, disorders is increasing, let's yep. assume that every child needs some degree of, of immune system support, yeah. at least yep. if, they've, if they haven't breastfed, if they were C-section delivered. So what would be some general guidelines that you would put in place that we could implement, that moms and dads could implement uh, in a relatively simple way, say, okay, here's the probiotics that would be beneficial. Here's the foods that would be, would be beneficial. What yeah. other things would you add in? Yeah. You know, I, I will say, you know, there are um, so many factors day to day that um, can really uh, cause disruption in the gut microbiome, you know, for kids and for adults, right? And so, mm -hmm. of course, we know that when you take antibiotics, that wipes out not just the good, the bad stuff, um, like, you know, that bacteria that's causing a sinus infection or an ear infection or the pneumonia, but it's mm -hmm. going to wipe out all the good bacteria in your gut. Um, it doesn't wipe out yeast, which is the reason why many women, for instance, when they take uh, antibiotics for urinary tract infections, it kills all the good probiotics in their vaginal uh, microbiome and their gut, and then all of a sudden they have a nasty yeast infection, right? Um, same thing can happen for kids, and for kids, interestingly, yeast, um, they don't necessarily get the, the typical, you know, the vaginal discharge and, and the itchiness, but they might develop... Um, mood issues, sleep issues, more tantrums, silliness. Okay. You know, a lot of kids when they have yeast overgrowth will get incredibly um, kind of over the top silly. I mean, parents will tell me it's almost as though they're, they're tipsy, right? Mm. Uh, because yeast release right. these alcohol byproducts, right? That get absorbed into our system and literally sometimes will we'll cause our kids to act like they're drunk. Um, and so we want to, you know, just be aware of that. Now, um, after we've taken antibiotics, one thing that I or even during the course of antibiotics, one of the things that's really important for parents to know is that they absolutely can and should give their child themselves probiotic supplements um, during that course of antibiotics and at least for a month afterwards. Now, so what, they, sorry, they should do it during the, the course of antibiotics? Uh, yes, I do recommend that, you know, okay. uh, because that way, um, even as we're kind of wiping out mm -hmm. you know, the good flora, yeah, we're just fortified. chasing it with kind of replacing as quickly as we can so that abnormal stuff doesn't take hold okay. uh, because there's of course a lot of antibiotic resistance out there and sure. then we don't want our gut to get colonized with all of these antibiotic resistant bacteria afterwards um, and so the key though is to give your probiotic away from your antibiotic dose so at least okay. one or two hours after you take your antibiotics um, and then once your baby has or child has finished his course of antibiotics, then you want to keep up with the probiotics again for at least a month, then the timing doesn't matter as much, right? Um, I also love, love, love that, you know, kids to get their probiotics through fermented foods. Um, you know, fermented foods, they can be an acquired taste, but if you start slowly and you keep it going, um, you know, that, that teaspoon of sauerkraut juice is gonna actually pack so much more bang for the buck for your gut than a probiotic pill. Um, and there's lots of delicious ways now to get fermented foods into kids, even if they don't like sauerkraut or pickles just yet. I, you know, when you buy pickles, you wanna make sure that you get the real, you know, fermented pickles, right? Uh, right? You know, Bubby's is a, is a brand that's really easy to find at Whole Foods. And that's a real fermented pickle. Great, um, great tip. So, but there's things like kefir. Um, and if you're dairy sensitive, there's delicious coconut kefir on the market now. Um, there's awesome kombuchas. I love kombucha and there's different flavors. I mean, one of my favorites is, um, is guava goddess, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's um, miso soup if your kids tolerate soy. Um, there's... Um, I mean, I grew up, I'm Korean, you know, by descent, and I grew up eating kimchi. And kimchi, they found, actually can kill um, the H1N1 flu virus, right? I no mean, these fermented foods yeah. have so much, so much benefit. Um, so, but apart from that, if your kids are not that into fermented foods, then taking a probiotic supplement. And My, mm -hmm. uh, what's your, what are your favorite brands? Yes, like, yeah. What should people look for? So what do we look for, you know, and Ben, I can actually give you, I'll send you a link for a guide that I wrote for parents on how to choose your kid's probiotic wow, be um, because I get this question a lot, right? And, yeah. you know, there are some really tasty kids chewable probiotics on the market. Um, most of them I don't recommend. I mean, they taste good and if your kids want them as a little treat, mm -hmm. then fine. Uh, but many of them only contain 
a couple of different strains of probiotics um, and perhaps maybe one million colony forming units right. of bacteria. So what we're really looking at in a probiotic are as many different strains mm -hmm. of lactobacillus species and bifidobacterium species as possible. As I mentioned, if you're under two, you do want to take an infant specific probiotic. If you're over two, you can take the same probiotic as an adult. Um, and we are looking on the order of billions, mm -hmm. 10 to 20 to 50 billion colony forming units, depending on what's going on with your child's gut or your gut. Um, I have a child right now who's got, um, he has uh, inflammatory bowel disease and, and I have him on you know, this very, very potent probiotic that has 450 billion colony forming wow. units. Um, most kids don't need that. You know, if your kid is otherwise healthy, um, after a round of antibiotics, I typically do about 25 billion colonies. If they're older, I might do more. There are some good brands that are readily available at a place like Whole Foods or health food stores. Um, I do find good results with Jarrow. That's pretty easy to find okay. in the refrigerated section. That's J-A-R-R-O-W. Um, Nature's Way also has a good line of Primadophilus products. Um, my favorite favorite brand though is a brand called Claire, K-L-A-I-R-E. Um, and so that's what I use for myself, my husband, and my children. Right. Um, I believe it is only available through practitioners, but they are one of the most highly respected probiotic manufacturers in the world. Um, and they have a children's chewable, they have a powder form, they have an infant probiotic, they have capsules. So lots of different ways that you can give probiotics. Um, you know, I have all sorts of different uh, tricks to give supplements to kids. <laughs> um, but you know, if they don't like uh, the chewable, you can always do a powder and mix it in with whatever they're um, yeah. eating or drinking. Um, and then, you know, with probiotic, with antibiotics, I also do recommend um, supporting the gut lining, um, making sure that they don't subsequently develop something called a leaky gut, where they where you can develop food sensitivities to anything that you're eating uh, too much of, um, or you know, just is more inflammatory to your system. Um, so having as much variety in your diet as possible, um, really trying to avoid um, the inflammatory foods during that healing process. For some kids, it might be longer, but the most inflammatory foods are going to be gluten and dairy. Um, okay. And we can talk about that, you know, in a little bit too, the, you know, the harm that gluten and dairy can cause for many of our kids. Um, but an amino acid called glutamine mm -hmm. can be very helpful in sort of uh, healing your gut lining, preventing leaky gut from forming after antibiotics. Um, you can get glutamine um, just by drinking bone broth, right? I love bone broth for its healing properties. So that's another great addition um, after antibiotics. Now at baseline though, let's say your kids are not on antibiotics and you just want to keep them healthy or um, um, they do have things like eczema or asthma and you want to know how do you support their gut to mm -hmm. get them even healthier. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a few different principles, right? The first principle is really trying to address what's going on in the gut. And this is even if you're healthy, right? I, I look at kids' gut to optimize their health and I often do a specialized stool test just to see what's in there. You know, not, not just, um, you know, do you have high levels of abnormal bacteria, but what is the composition of right. the good probiotics? You know, what, it, what are the few imbalances that might exist? Is there a yeast overgrowth? And then I address that. So we're really supporting the gut, trying to take away anything that's irritating or inflaming to the gut, which includes bugs and it also includes foods right? Some yeah. foods, right? And this is where we get to the idea of a leaky gut where, you know, we have these, what are called tight junctions in between your small intestinal cells. You know, they're, they're, um, they're very, very um, efficient at keeping out viruses and bacteria and larger particles of foods that shouldn't get into our bloodstream. But over time, whether it's with emotional stress or physiologic stress, like an infection or whatever illness yeah. we're encountering, the, the spaces between our small intestinal cells just start to spread apart and they get a little leaky. Mm -hmm. And our small intestinal lining gets a little frayed, less efficient at bringing in nutrients, less efficient at blocking out the things that shouldn't get in. And over time, those larger, um, you know, proteins like gluten and casein um, can enter our bloodstream and eventually, eventually our immune system says, hey, look, you know, this is too much for me. I'm going to build an inflammatory response and it's going to show up in whatever way it shows up on your kid. 
like so, the skin, right? Okay, yeah. So, so what are the main? So, what are the main issues with gluten and and dairy? Casein being the main protein yes. in dairy, so people. Yep. Are- clear. Yes. Yeah. So there are a couple of different issues. I mean, gluten and casein by themselves are, are, are some of our more inflammatory foods. Um, so for kids who have any chronic health condition, those are two of the first foods that I try off. Um, whether okay. you're having reflux or um, atopic illness like eczema and asthma. And, or and you, this is even if there's no diagnosed celiac disease or anything. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly right. You know, I do check for celiac disease before I get kids off of gluten just to know, you know, how how long we may need to keep this child off of gluten. Is it a lifelong elimination Mm -hmm. or temporary elimination while we're trying to heal their gut? Um, But gluten and casein are highly inflammatory. We need to, you know, when our kids' immune systems are dysregulated um, and their nervous systems are dysregulated, we want to reduce the inflammatory load. Um, For some kids, gluten and casein can actually get converted into these opioid-like compounds, um, literally these morphine-like compounds that cause brain fog, difficulty thinking, confusion, you know, difficulty processing, um, mood, you know, kind of instability. Uh, and so for those kids, when they go off of gluten and casein, this is what I see for a lot of kids with autism or sensory issues, um, parents will say, it's like the lights went on right? It's like they wake up and they're fully present um, and they're not in that brain fog. But this is a lot of adults will notice when they go off of gluten and or casein, um, their brain fog lifts, right? They don't even realize how fuzzy headed they were, right? Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's something that I've experimented a lot with yep. um, since I've been uh, a consultant, but, but absolutely gluten can be a, a big one. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, you know, we don't want to just think about what we're taking away. We want to think about what we're putting in, right? And, you know, we hear about eating a rainbow of colors, but that really is very important for kids, getting in all those phytonutrients. Um, each of those phytonutrients, and I tell kids in the office, you know, even, even when they're two and three and they're coming in and I, and I ask about their diet, you know, I let them know that each of those colors has a different vitamin or mm-hmm. mineral, right? A different supercharged nutrient that's going to help their brain think faster. It's going to help their body run faster. It's going to help their, their belly feel better. Right. Right. Um, so all of those, um, have different, uh, have a different, um, positive impact on our gut lining, on our immune system. So, you know, it's great if your kids are eating lots of greens, but then we want to get in some of the oranges and the purples, right? Um, And the browns, right? Um, So getting in that rainbow of colors and making it a game. There's some games out there now for kids to really get them on the right track to eating that rainbow of of, um, fruits and vegetables. Um, But you know, if your kids are not that into fruits and vegetables, and some kids with the sensory issues, um, it's very challenging, you know, to get any fruit or vegetable into them. You know, we start slow, right? Some kids might need to have some occupational therapy work to kind of you know, desensitize them. Um, but, you know, apart from that, there are ways to initially just get them in, you know, there's a book called the sneaky chef that has different Mm -hmm. ideas to kind of sneak fruits and vegetables in. Um, But you can puree, you know, zucchini, um, uh, carrots, um, spinach, and put them into your meatballs and put them into your soups. And, you know, they really don't add much quote, flavor, you know, for your kids to notice. Right. Um, and into smoothies, you can throw so yes. many different things into your smoothies. I throw nuts and seeds and spinach and kale. And, you know, the greens do make your smoothies look a little murky, right? Mm-hmm. So one thing that you can do, if you have um, um, a cup that, you know, maybe a stainless steel cup with a cover on it that they just drink with a straw, then they, you can, if they're looking at it and saying, oh, what's that green brown stuff, dad? Right. I don't want that. <laughs> you know, you can, you can but, it, but it tastes delicious, right? So then you can mask the color or or another great thing to do is just put some roast some beets, dice them up and put them in the freezer, and then you throw in a handful of frozen beets into your mm-hmm. smoothie. Beets will add sweetness and add a beautiful pink color, right, to, to yeah. almost anything you're eating. So then you have this beautiful pink smoothie that happens to have beets in it, giving it that beautiful red color, um, and, and kids may be more willing to try it. Um, so getting in those phytonutrients is really important. Um, you know, there are some supplements that I do typically recommend for kids um, because most kids aren't eating enough of the foods that give them those great omega-3 essential fatty acids, like you know, our fatty fish, right. um, nuts and seeds. And of course, with fish, we want to be mindful of not getting 
too much mercury exposure and arsenic exposure from seafood. Um, so there are some limitations on what kind of fish you know, we want to eat and how often we want to eat fish. Um, and a great resource is the environmental, uh, not the environmental work, they are a great resource uh, mm -hmm. for pesticides and foods. Um, but the Monterey Bay Aquarium, you know, in my neck of the woods here in California, they have a program called Seafood Watch. And they have great little pocket guides on safe fish to consume um, and that can change season by season so they'll give you they uh, they have a little printable pocket guide that you can put into your wallet when you're shopping for seafood um, and it even um, it even breaks it down by location you know where you are in the states so you can know okay you know uh, right now um, tilapia is not such a great fish right. to eat, but maybe I'll, you know, I'll go for the black cod. <laughs> um, so it can inform your seafood choices a, a little bit better. Um, but I do recommend fish oils for kids, right? I think that most kids don't get yeah. enough omega-3 essential fatty acids that they need more, especially if they're having attention issues or itchy skin or wheezing um, or any sort of immune reg dysregulation if they're just getting colds, you know, frequently. Um, there are some really good fish oils out there. A lot of us remember when we were kids taking that, you know, awful tasting cod liver oil with, you know, our mother's right. tasting after us with the spoon. Um, they do have different flavors available out now. Right now, what's very popular with a lot of kids that, is that um, you know, my children love, they're called swirls. So this custard-like kind of thicker fish oil um, that, you know, come in mango flavor. Nordic, yeah, Naturals sure. has, mm -hmm, Nordic Naturals has one called Mango Boost that is delicious. Um, another favorite of mine is, um, is by a company called Designs for Health, and they have a lemon drop smoothie fish oil. Yeah, and these taste one. like creamsicles, right? They're delicious. Um, so, so fish oils are really important. Probiotics are really important for optimizing gut and immune health. Um, vitamin D is very important. You know, you're in Arizona, I'm here in California, mm -hmm. it's sunny, you know, much of the year, but even in the middle of summer when kids are outside all day, every day, when I measure their vitamin D levels, they almost all of them are either outright deficient or insufficient. And vitamin D is so critical for proper immune and brain health. Um, so that's another supplement that I really am very um, consistent about recommending. Um, we might also, depending on what's going on with that child, recommend, or I might recommend magnesium and zinc. Those are yeah. two huge deficiencies, not just in kids, but in adults as well, right? I'm sure as you see. And the tip-offs that your child might need magnesium, extra magnesium, which you can find in dark leafy greens, nuts and seeds, um, you know, uh, dark chocolate. You know, I love getting our minerals and vitamins from food if we can. Unfortunately for most of us, if our needs are higher, there's just no way we're going to get enough from food. Um, so some tip-offs for magnesium deficiency in your kids will be things like anxiety, constipation, tummy aches, trouble focusing um, and sitting still, trouble falling asleep. Um, zinc, now zinc is found in um, pumpkin seeds, in chicken, um, in dairy, if your children you know, can tolerate dairy. You know, I don't recommend drinking cow's milk, but cultured dairy, you know, yogurts and cheeses um, can be a great source of dairy if your child can tolerate casein. Um, and mm -hmm. so signs of zinc, deficiencies or insufficiencies can be things like sensory issues. There's kids that, you know, they, they cover their ears and can't stand the sound of the blender, you know, going or the vacuum going. The kids who the tags on the back of their shirt just drive them crazy. Mm -hmm. And we have parents who are cutting off those tags or getting seamless socks and their kids will only wear the softest pants, <laughs> right? You know, because they don't, they can't stand the stand of scratchy jeans on their body. Um, other tip offs, kids with eczema for sure, you know, will have um, higher needs for zinc because zinc is really important for skin and gut repair. Kids who just constantly have looser stools, um, you know, the toddler diarrhea, they are losing zinc from their gut. Um, kids who um, are getting sick frequently because zinc supports our immune system right. or kids who um, are picky eaters, right? You know, picky zinc deficiency changes how we taste food. So sometimes just giving a little extra zinc as a supplement, all of a sudden your kids now are more willing to smell a food or try a food um, and, and not as picky. 
Um, so those are some of the basic foundational supplements that I'll recommend uh, right. for kids. Um, and then of course, again, really when we're looking at our food, you know, trying to eat as clean as possible. What, do, what does that mean, you know, to eat clean? Um, it means trying to eat organically as possible and organic can be quite expensive. And this is where we go back to the environmental working group. Um, every year they come out with a list of the dirty dozen, uh, which is a list of our most heavily sprayed foods. Um, bell peppers and strawberries are always on that list as is kale. Um, so those foods that are on the dirty dozen, I always buy organic. Um, and then the foods that are on the clean right. 15 list, um, you have a little more leeway with. So don't feel that it has to be 100%, um, but to the extent possible, eating um, you know, pesticide-free organic off the dirty dozen list. Um, and then for the most part, trying to eat as clean as possible. Um, you know, being mindful of heavy metals in our food, like uh, from fish, um, from our water, purifying our water, um, yeah. you know, to get out the impurities is very important. Um, Great. And plastics, right? That's another huge issue. But um, I do not recommend storing your food in plastic and never, ever, ever heating up food in the microwave in plastic because all of that plastic is going to leach out, um, you know, phthalates and parabens and right. bisphenol A and other chemicals, even if it's BPA free into your food. And those are potent endocrine disruptors. Um, we're seeing kids and boys entering puberty way too early nowadays. We're seeing mm -hmm. thyroid problems, you know, Hashimoto's or subclinical hypothyroidism in younger and younger kids. And I see kids who are in middle school having trouble with focusing and anxiety and I check their thyroid levels and they're not optimal. And as soon as we optimize their thyroid, they're happy and they're focusing and they're, you know, they're doing well in school and doing well socially. Um, so those are some of the factors going into really how to optimize your kids' health. Awesome. No, that's incredible, incredible information. Um, I want to dive back into the gut health mm -hmm. um, in two specific, two specific things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about what we should be looking for from um, digestive system health. How frequently should kids be going to the bathroom? <laughs> um, quality of stool health and, and helping people understand that that's a good representation of their digestive system health and of the types of foods potentially that are contributing to that. And then I want to work up to the other end of the digestive system and look at the tonsils and the adenoids. Yes. And I want you to talk about if, um, how those are affected with uh, immune dysregulation and, and what we would typically see, what we're seeing, you know, in kids these days. Yeah. Yeah. So um, great, great question. Um, so pooping, I ask kids every visit about their poop and you know, some of them will giggle. Some of them will, some of them will say, well, we don't do potty talk. Right. And I'll tell them, look in the doctor's office, we talk about poop. It's not potty talk because it's very important, yeah. you know, for your health. And I tell kids and parents that, you know, how you're pooping and what your poop looks like is, is really key to um, figuring out whether or not your gut is healthy. Um, now there can be some kids who have beautiful poops and still their gut is dysregulated. But, but what we're looking at for poops is, uh, you know, I would love a daily poop right? I mean, pooping once a day at the very, very minimum every other day. Now, you know, as parents, we are so grateful when our kids are potty trained and independent, mm -hmm. you know, wiping themselves, you know, off to school, right? But, but it's really important to check in with your kids every once in a while, because when I ask kids, how often are you pooping? I just had a kid yesterday who was, um, oh my gosh, how old was he? He was eight or nine. And I said, well, how often do you think you poop? And he sat there and he thought about it and he said, hmm, maybe once a month. <laughs> and I'm like, oh mm, I don't think so. Right. Let's, let's pay attention because kids aren't pe paying attention. They're not yeah. keeping track. Right. Yeah. Um, and as it turned out, he actually is pooping mostly every day. Yeah. Right. But I have had kids who say, well, I don't know, maybe every week or maybe a couple of times a week. And then parents start keeping track and it literally is once a week. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't know once our kids are off to, you know, off to elementary school, we're not keeping track. You know, if they're pooping at school, we don't know. I mean, sometimes they leave evidence at home. Right. Sure. Um, but for the most part, we may not know. So really, you know, periodically checking and making sure that they're pooping at least once a day, every other day. And what should it look like? You know, there is a poop chart that you can look up online. 
It's called the Bristol stool chart, right? (laughs) B-R-I-S-T-O-L, right? It's all the information Um, you need. Exactly. And it's it's graphic, right? It shows pictures of what your poop should look like. Um, And so, you know, our poop should, I tell kids, it should look like a long brown banana, right? I mean, it should look smooth. There might be some clumps in there, but it should stay together. It shouldn't be little tiny pieces. It shouldn't be mush that just kind of separates in the toilet. It should sink to the bottom of the toilet. It shouldn't float because floating means that there's a lot of fat and air in it. So that might mean that you're not absorbing your fat very well, right? Right. Um, And um, it shouldn't have, you shouldn't have a green, you know, greasy sheen on top of the toilet bowl, right? So we're looking for a really nice, soft but well-formed daily stool right with not a lot of tummy aches before or after Um, and when kids aren't so now typically I'll see more kids with constipation right they're not pooping every day um, or their poops they might be pooping every day but they're really hard Um, they look dry and almost like they're they're black and burnt um, or they're little pieces little rabbit pellets Mm -hmm. that are in the toilet and that's more common and I think that has that's a reflection of all the stress that we have nowadays Um, partially we're rushing and many of us get that urge to poop we have this gastrocolic reflex where after we eat something we need to poop and we see this with babies every time they nurse or get a bottle oftentimes they have a little something come out whether it's a little squirt or a big poop Um, as adults and, and kids, we tend to have that reflex either after breakfast or after dinner or sometimes both. But if we're eating breakfast, we're rushing, we have five minutes to get our shoes on, get the backpacks on, get out the door, otherwise we're gonna be late for our carpool. Oftentimes we have to suppress that urge, right? And then it might not come back later that day. And then right. if we're rushed again the next day, it might not come back till the next day. And then we can get into this vicious cycle. So part of it is our lifestyle. You know, we're just not, we're not slowing down enough. Um, part of it is, um, you know, that we're stressed. Most of us, kids and adults, live in this world in, in what's called sympathetic overdrive. We're in this fight or flight state. What happens when this fight or flight state, you know, where we're thinking about our homework that we have to do, or we're thinking about the next appointment we have to make, or we're thinking about, you know, our, um, our, our friends who might be, you know, kind of bullying us or not so kind to us. Um, our muscles clench up, and that includes our anal sphincter muscles, right? Yeah. So there actually is something to the term anally retentive, because when we're in that fight or flight mode, if you think about it from the caveman days, if we're running from that saber-toothed tiger, the last thing our body wants to do is stop and poop, right? right. Um, so we need to get back to that rest and digest state, that parasympathetic state. Um, and most of us, parents included, we don't know how to do that. Totally. And so that includes things like, you know, learning how to meditate if that draws you, going for walks out in nature, um, you know, exercising, right? They found that exercise, you know, it's fascinating. There's one study looking at exercise compared with an antidepressant. Exercise oh, yeah. hands down improved depression um, better than any SSRI, right? Like Prozac or Lexapro and had sustained effects. Um, so really, you know, getting in that daily exercise where we're moving our body, getting oxygen to our brain, getting oxygen to our gut, moving our lymphatics, you know, just moving your legs can just get that pump going, right? So that we actually do move our bowels better. Um, so, and then also the foods, kids are not getting enough fiber in their diets. Um, they're not hydrated enough. And I literally will sit down and talk with kids and ask them how much they're drinking. Most of them don't know. So I'll do a little challenge, right? We weigh them in the office and, you know, I want them to be drinking about half of their body weight in ounces of water. Now, if they're super active and on the soccer team or competitive gymnast or, you know, outdoors every single afternoon on the trampoline, then they have higher needs. So I factor that in and I say, look, if you are, you know, let's say we have a 50 pound second grader, you know, who is very active, you know, plays softball after school every day. Um, Well, I want you to drink at a minimum 25 ounces of water, but on the days where you're outside, you know, practicing, let's aim for 35 ounces to 40 ounces, right? So then we take their water bottle. We know exactly how many ounces that is. And for, you know, 
three days, take a weekend. You only drink from that water bottle so you know exactly how much you're eating and you get that minimum in throughout the day. And notice how your brain feels how your mood is, what your sleep is like, what your energy is. And for kids, you know, we don't motivate them by saying, oh, look how healthy you'll be, right? right? That's too nebulous, right? We ask them, wow, I want you to pay attention to how, how far could you hit that softball? Yeah. How fast did you run around the bases this time? If they're, you know, if they're a pianist, how easy was it to remember your, you know, your musical piece, right? We get them where they're interested, what motivates them. And for them, this nebulous idea about being healthy and supporting their gut, that's what we want as parents, right? That's not what they want. They care how fast they are, you know, how shiny their hair looks, right? right. If their skin is free of acne, right? Um, if they have energy to you know, keep up with their friends. I mean, we want to think about what's motivating to them because that is going to be impacted, but we then just have to shift their brain to think about you know, how, how they feel um, with what's motivating them. Um, so hydration is really key as well. Perfect. perfect. No, that's, that's perfect for the importance of, uh, of daily bowel yes. movements, what yep. it should look like, yep. how we contribute to a healthy bowel movement daily yep. for adults as well. Yeah. Now, mm. Ben, I do have, I wrote, because constipation is such a huge issue, I wrote on my um, blog site, healthykidshappykids.com, one of my first blog posts was on constipation um, oh, in kids and what to do from a more holistic, integrative standpoint. Um, so, so there's I'll a lot of this. There, yep. And there's actually a, uh, a picture of the Bristol poop chart in there. <laughs> so you don't have to look it up online. So I will um, add that link in the, uh, in the notes. Um, yeah, because there's so much we can do without resorting to Miralax. And if your kids are already oh, yeah. on Miralax, right, there's, we can get your kids off of Miralax. But Miralax is polyethylene glycol. It's antifreeze, right? And so if we can really, really work on um, avoiding that Miralax or weaning your child off of Miralax, um, it's going to just optimize their health in the long run. Perfect. So let's move to the other end of the digestive system. Yeah. And we'll, we'll kind of start to wrap things up, but I, want to I really want to hit on the tonsils, adenoids, mm -hmm. removal, what's going on yeah. there? Yeah. Why is it becoming so prevalent? Um, tell me your medical opinion. Yeah. You know, t um, I tell parents that tonsils are there for a reason. I tell kids this too, right? This is part of our immune system. And when tonsils and adenoids are big, there's a reason, right? Our immune system is reacting to something, right? And we just have to figure out what that something is, right? Um, so many more children are being diagnosed with sleep apnea. My son had horrible yes. sleep apnea. I mean, I have pictures of him when he was, um, you know, 18 months, two years of age, um, pausing in his sleep and his whole chest would cave in and I would be watching just kind of adjusting his head to try to get his airway open. And it's frightening to watch. But on the other hand, you know, we tried to figure out what was going on with his tonsils. Why were they so huge? I mean, they were kissing right up there. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to do your, your, your evaluation. You want to see, do they have signs of environmental allergies, right? Some kids don't have evidence. They don't show their allergies with itchy eyes, runny nose, you know, um, sore throat. They will show their allergies by accumulating all of that inflammation in their tonsils and their adenoids. So um, that's, that's something that we want to look at. Um, food sensitivities play a huge role. Um, dairy is a huge factor, um, but it can be, again, when we get back to this leaky gut, it might be sensitivities to any food. When I did a food sensitivity test, we can identify food sensitivities through an elimination diet, but for kids, it's often easiest to start with a blood test just to guide what we're eliminating as opposed to eliminating, you know, 10 foods at one time. You know, an adult, we can do that. It's a little harder for children to do that. Not impossible. But for my son, I was so ready to be 100% gluten-free and dairy-free. I mean, we're already gluten and dairy light. Right. So I thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll be 100%. His tonsils will shrink, no problem. It wasn't gluten. It wasn't dairy. It was eggs. Okay. His egg okay. sensitivity was through the roof. And I've been giving him eggs every single morning because eggs are so great for you, right? That egg yolk, rich mm -hmm. in cholesterol, that's brain food, you know, totally. rich in choline, right? I love eggs, but <laughs> so I was just, I was floored and just, I mean, you know, a little bit devastated because I thought, mm. oh my gosh, I have to shift breakfast around now. But we did it, right? We did yeah. it. Um, and, and then also um, figuring out that his gut, his gut actually was harboring a lot of strep. Um, so we did a gut clean out and we were able to, you know, shrink his tonsils, get him much more comfortable. Now, 
and I did use some homeopathic medicines and we got him to a place where he was, um, he was doing well. Unfortunately, I will say for my son, I did end up needing to get a tonsillectomy for Mm him. Um, and, um, and it absolutely made a huge difference. But for many kids in my practice, when their tonsils aren't quite kissing and we can get to them early enough, I mean, this is where being a doctor and a mother may not be the best thing because sometimes we don't necessarily do for ourselves and for our children what we would yes. do you know, for the kids in our yes. practice until later on down the road. But for the kids that I see in my practice, um, we can many, many times figure out what the inflammatory triggers are, remove them, get the kids on a super clean diet, optimize their, their mouth microflora and microbiome, right? We have a, a huge uh, microbiome in our mouth that's actually different from our gut. So there are some mouth specific probiotics, right? And we can avoid a lot of those tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies. Um, now for kids who have recurrent strep throat infections or have problems with um, an, an autoimmune brain infection, um, inflammation called PANDAS, uh, which is stands for pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep, that's a devastating you know, neuropsychiatric illness that can occur with repeated strep infections and it's an autoimmune illness. For some of those kids, I just recommend getting the tonsils out because they can harbor that strep. Mm-hmm. But, but for most healthy, typical you know, um, kids who are developing normally and have healthy immune systems, if it's just that your tonsils and adenoids are big and we can figure out what's going on, we, we can figure it out in most cases, right? Get the, get the mouth healthy, get the gut healthy, bounce the immune system and avoid that, that surgery. Beautiful, beautiful. Very, very good information. <laughs> Parents, do your detective work and, mm-hmm. and really try yeah. and understand what's going on with your kids and, and do your homework and, and speak to your practitioners about it. And um, of course, sometimes, you know, you do what you got to do, but, but from a, you know, from a, a holistic standpoint is there's obviously a lot of different ways where we can support our child's immune system. I have one more question about yeah. um, the immune system, about when our children start, and, and as adults, when we start to fight, uh, uh, when we start to fight infection, yeah. what the process is like, how we can support the process. So specifically um, with when our children start to have a fever, um, yeah. how do we respond to that fever? At what point, you know, do we allow it to go? Do we try and suppress it right away? Should we be using over the counter medications? Do we take them to the doctor? You know, what, what's kind of, um, a healthy approach to addressing the fighting infections? Yeah. Great question. Because, you know, I think that this, uh, this phenomena of fever phobia, right, is huge um, among parents and practitioners. And oftentimes when you go to urgent care or to the ER and your child has a fever, the very first thing that happens, even before, you know, checking out how the child's doing is, here, here you go, you know, here's some Tylenol, here's your right? Tylenol. Yep. So a couple of things with fever that I just want parents to be aware of, you know, fever is our, our body's natural response to infection and inflammation. Right? It's our body's way of getting our immune system, right? our white blood cells and our, our kind of army cells mobilized right, to fight whatever's going on. And there are some studies looking at giving um, fever reducers, Tylenol, you know, for viral infections. And they sh- the studies show that reducing the fever artificially actually prolongs the duration of many viral illnesses. And so you know, we don't necessarily want to treat fevers um, because we, we're hindering our body's ability to actually fight that infection. Um, the other thing too with, glut- uh, with Tylenol is acetaminophen. Tylenol depletes the levels of a very, very important antioxidant called glutathione in our body. Right. Glutathione is critical for optimal detoxification, for immune functioning, for cellular functioning. Um, and glutathione is very important um, when we are fighting infections. And so Tylenol lowers our body's levels of glutathione and can have a harmful impact on our liver, which then doubly makes it more difficult to fight what's going on. So if we're going to use a fever reducer, my preferred fever reducer is actually ibuprofen, um, which is Motrin or Advil. Um, so when would I treat a fever? Well, you know, I actually, this is why I use um, a more integrative pediatric toolkit. I use homeopathic medicines and I use herbal medicines um, and essential oils to help the body naturally um, 
not bring down the fever, but naturally um, support what our body's trying to do so that the time of having the fever is shortened and our body gets healthier faster. Um, but that being said, if kids are so uncomfortable that they're not able to drink and stay hydrated, or they're so uncomfortable that they're not able to fall asleep at night, then I do give a fever reducer like ibuprofen. They don't have to, their temperature doesn't have to go back down to normal, um, but you know, just comfortable enough that then they can stay hydrated um, and they can get to sleep because hydration and sleep are really important when we're sick. Um, in terms of um, you know, when to see the doctor, you know, <laughs> that's a, a tough question. You know, if your baby is under three months of age or under six months of age, absolutely, because your baby's immune system is very different than the immune system of a toddler or an older kid. And we take those infections much more seriously. If they're over six months of age and they're, um, you know, the signs that I look for to really worry about a fever is look at your child. Don't look at the height of the fever, right? Kids routinely, my daughter gets up to 104, 104 and a half. Yeah. And she's looking at me doing her artwork. She's a little bit more subdued, but she's fine, right? Um, so we want to look at her child. You know, if your child is not making good eye contact, if you're talking to them and they seem confused with what they're saying, if they're just laid out on the couch and it's really difficult to get them up, you know, if, they're, if they haven't peed, you know, had some urine in more than six to eight hours, um, those are all indications to get to the doctor because there might be something more serious going on or they might be dehydrated and need some support. Right. Other yeah. than that, what happens when you go to the doctor? Right. I mean, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Your kid has a fever, a little cold. All right. Here's some Tylenol. We can't really give you Sudafed because that's not recommended for kids anymore. Just go home, you know, drink fluids. And if your kid has a fever still after five days or still has a runny nose after two weeks, come back because then we can give them antibiotics for a possible sinus infection. Right. There's not a lot you can do. So that's where, you know, having this natural medicines toolkit is huge um, because if we can start with these uh, natural medicines early on, we can nip that fever in the bud, get your kid back to being healthy and thriving um, and avoid getting a secondary infection like an ear infection or a sinus infection that does require antibiotics, right? Um, and so with that, um, there are, you know, I'm throwing a lot of resources at you, but I actually have an ebook on, you know, how to treat Perfect. fevers naturally. <laughs> so I'll get you that link too. But, um, but, you know, things like, of course, hydration are really important. And when I hydrate kids with fevers, I recommend drinks with electrolytes like coconut water, because when we have a fever and we're sweating, we're losing minerals from our skin, which can then make us feel a little weaker. And, and you know, the electrolyte fluids are going to be much more hydrating. You can make a homemade, um, Pedialyte that's much healthier, you know, than the Pedialyte out there. You mean um, Gatorade? Gatorade won't do yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, don't get the don't get the blue or what is it, the icy blue, please. <laughs> um, and um, and then there are essential oils like lavender and chamomile um, and peppermint that can be um, cooling and anti-inflammatory to the body. There are herbs like elderberry, which is really mm -hmm. easy to find at Whole Foods. Elderberry has amazing antiviral and immune um, supporting properties, um, and it does taste good. So kids are, are very likely to, to take it. Um, so um, there are some, some herbal remedies that are amazing to use to support your child and some homeopathic medicines. If you're not familiar with homeopathic medicines, I do use homeopathic medicines very frequently. There's a lot of good evidence to show that they can be very effective and very safe um, for kids. And those are also very easy to find. So, um, you know, you can, you can take a look at the ebook and get some ideas and try it because if you try it and your kid gets better faster after their next illness, you're going to get more confidence and keep using it and get even more benefits, right? Um, and, and your kids will get healthier and healthier in the long run. That's great. That's great. That's such good, valuable information that I think people will really, I think it will really resonate with all the moms and dads listening. So I'm, I'm so appreciative for that. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, Thank you for having me. This is great. Oh, of course, of course. So where can people find more about you? Mm -hmm. So my blog is probably the best place for people to find out more about me, what I do, and also um, as a resource for you. Um, I have lots of different articles on how to treat ear infections naturally, you know, to avoid antibiotics, how to treat constipation, how to treat seasonal allergies. I don't know about you in Arizona, but it's been a horrible allergy season here in California. So I have a couple articles on that, um, you know 
the cold and flu season, how to support your child naturally through the cold and flu season. So that, my blog site is Healthy Kids, Happy Kids, and that's www.healthykidshappykids.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I, I um, am fairly active in posting the latest articles on kids' health and the, um, the latest resources for parents. Um, and then my practice is here in California. It's called Whole Family Wellness, and that's www.wholefamilywellness.org. Um, unfortunately, you know, I do have to see kids in the office for their very first visit. Um, and then every year afterwards, follow-ups can be by phone, um, you know, in, in that meantime. Um, but for most families, that's not feasible. And, um, and so that's why I started the blog, so that parents, no matter where they live, can have access to... Uh, more holistic pediatric information from a pediatrician so that they know that I've done my homework. I'm not going to, you know, give you information that doesn't have a lot of good evidence and that I haven't seen myself in practice work for my patients. Um, so that's probably the best way. Well, that's perfect. So Dr. Elisa, thank you so much. You're obviously um, <laughs> making a huge impact on not only your own family's health, but the health of so many other families um, really across the country, across the world. And, and we're so grateful to have had the opportunity to you know, share this time with you. Thank you so much. I know you have such a busy schedule. So um, I'm, I'm so appreciative of your time. And uh, just you know, don't hesitate to let me know what I can do to support you. And uh, we'll make sure to provide all of those resources for everyone listening. Um, so Thank that, you, Ben. This is so great. I'm so glad that we connected way back at, at our MindShare conference. Yeah. And then again, you know, yeah. last year. Um, and, and I absolutely want to stay in touch with you. I love the work that you're doing and um, would love to be in touch through the years. We absolutely will. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.